So hi, everyone, and welcome to Whisper Their Love, the subversive nature of lesbian pulp. Um, this is a collaboration between Gerber Hart LGBTQ plus library and the archives of Chicago um, over in Chicago, Illinois, and Wanderground Lesbian Archive Library in Providence, Rhode Island. And then, yeah, we're here with uh, uh, the History Project in Boston, Massachusetts, where we're documenting LGBTQ plus Boston. So uh, my name is Matisse, and I am the program's coordinator for the History Project. And just in case anyone is new to the History Project, well, welcome. We're hosting this event, and we are Boston's queer community archives. We are dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing Boston's queer history. So if you're at all interested in LGBTQ plus history, especially in Boston or New England, please be sure to follow us on social media, subscribe to our newsletter, and you can learn all about our upcoming events. I'm just going to pop our Instagram in here. Um, and uh, yeah, you can follow us. And uh, yeah. So I have a couple of things I want to tell you about before we get going while I've got your attention. Um, one of those things is our marriage equality collection. So we're in Massachusetts here, and this is the 25th anniversary of marriage equality passing, which is really exciting. Um, what we're doing with the History Project to celebrate is we're trying to create a community generated history of marriage equality. So we're asking people to share their wedding, their LGBTQ wedding stories from the last 25 years. So submitting photos, uh, videos, your invitations, if you've got that scanned, please, please, please go to the link in the chat. It's historyproject.org slash marriage. And there you can um, add in your stories, you know, and I know we're going to be listening about like some very salt, like saucy materials tonight, you know, Weddings are a bit buttoned up, but they don't have to be. And so if you've got some fun wedding photos from your from your gay weddings, please, please, please submit them to our archives. We're trying to document and preserve your stories. Um, our one other thing I'd like to plug is our um, is our uh, sort of Pride 365 campaign. We're trying to make sure that we're preserving, protecting, and sharing queer history every single day, not just during Pride Month. So um, we are, uh, we're, ra we're a community funded organization. And so we've got uh, another couple months left to the end of the year. And so we're trying to just finish off our fundraising by hitting $10,000. We're really excited. We're almost at 6,000 already, which is like incredible. We're so thankful to everyone. Um, so if you have a moment or if you've got a couple extra dollars, go ahead and check out our campaign. And anyways, thank you all so much for listening to my little spiel. And Honestly, let's get on to the lesbian pulps because that's the exciting part, right? Um, everyone, if you find in your Zoom, you can do your little reactions. You know, we can do those all night. And so let's give it up. Let's, let's, get, let's get excited about lesbian pulps. Is everyone excited about lesbian pulps as I am? I, I love them. They're so much fun. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to invite and introduce our first guest, uh, Jen Duntel from Gerber Hart. Jen is the Community Outreach and Strategic Partnerships Manager at Gerber Hart Library and Archives, where she has volunteered since 2014. Jen manages Gerber Hart's community programming, social media, and communications. Jen's independent research on Chicago pulp author and activist Valerie Taylor was published in Queer Between the Covers from the University of London Press. Um, Jen, we are so excited and honored to have you. I'm just gonna spotlight you and away you go. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Matisse. It's wonderful to be here. I absolutely love pulp, so I'm so excited to be talking uh, tonight. Let me just share my screen. All right. Can you see that okay? Awesome. All right. So today I am here to talk about queer pulp and lesbian pulp specifically, but to talk about is this subversive? Is this trash? Is this both? Um, and so we'll go into that a little bit, but just wanted to say a few words about Gerber Hart. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jen Dentel and I work at Gerber Hart Library and Archives. We are an LGBTQ plus library and archives in Chicago. Uh, we've been around since 1981 and we focus on collecting, preserving, and making accessible the LGBTQ plus history of Chicago in the Midwest. So similar uh, to Wanderground and Boston History Project, we do we do very similar work, but in the Midwest in Chicago. Um, we are almost entirely volunteer based, but there are three of us that are full time now, including myself, which is very exciting as of last year. And we are privately funded by donations and grants. So just a little bit about us. We have a circulating library. So this is a, a lending library where anyone over 13 can check out up to 10 books at a time. There are no fees. We're not part of the public library system or any institution. 
Um, and we also have an archives. Again, the archives is entirely focused on Chicago in the Midwest. And then a special collections where we have things like travel guides, periodicals, pulp novels um, that are in special collections that don't circulate. Uh, ephemera and more. And if you want to learn more, I'll pop some links in the chat later, uh, but you can go to our website. We have a lot of online resources there. If you're in Chicago, please check out our programming. Our next big program is on December 7th. We are having a queer Kindle Marked, which is going to be a combination book sale and then a local artist and makers market as well. Uh, we also have an Instagram and Facebook, and then we have a podcast called Unboxing Queer History, where we take a deep dive into some of our collections. But back to pulp. Um, so again, we're looking at pulp, uh, lesbian pulp in specific. And just a little note about content. I know uh, Matisse mentioned this a little bit, but just want to mention that a lot of the pulps that we're going to talk about, there are definitely some strong themes of, you know, violence, racism, sexism. Um, a lot of time, the language that we're going to be using in these pulps or that the pulps are using were very outdated. Um, pulps were often a way of being voyeuristic and looking in on a marginalized group, often a very marginalized group. Uh, lesbian pulp is not the only group that um, pulps were concerned with, so sometimes there can be problematic. Often there's a lot of problematic material in these pulps, so just want to give a note about that content. Um, so yeah, what is pulp? Um, you might be wondering, you've probably seen pulp when you've been out. Um, I have a stack next to me. This is Valerie Taylor's first pulp. It's actually not a lesbian pulp. But if you see um, this paper, it looks very cheap. It's very yellowed. Often there's kind of a smell to the, to the pulps as well. Um, but they were very cheap. So they were named for the quality of the paper that they were used in publishing. Often they have this really lurid cover that's going to lure you in to look at it like this uh, campus sex club. You know, you see this cover and it's very titillating and you want to know more about what's inside. Um, I think it was Valerie Taylor that described them as, you know, a paperback with a lurid cover that you can read on the bus um, and then throw them away. They were considered very disposable. Um, they were often very sensational. So they would deal, like I mentioned, with marginalized groups, um, you know, lesbian and gay men. This is something that was very much covered in pulps. We also look at things like sex workers or, you know, teenage delinquents, uh, drug users. There were a lot of ways of kind of looking in on these groups. Often the covers are very sexualized. Um, oh, and if you look in the background, you can see just a little, little hint of some of my pulps that I personally collect, which is a mix of them, which, um, you know, they're, they're fun. Um, and then, you know, when we're talking about queer pulp, um, we're thinking about the 1950s and 60s for the golden age of, of publishing for these lesbian pulp novels. And what's interesting about pulp, I think similar sometimes when you think about things like romance novels, because the genre was not taken seriously by a lot of people, they could push boundaries and they could publish things that other, you know, quote unquote, legitimate publishers couldn't get past the censors. Um, so it was kind of this gray area where they could operate because the genre was considered a trash genre, they could get away with things. Um, and so kind of early rules for a lot of this early queer pulp that we're seeing, they they couldn't these novels couldn't promote homosexuality, so there had to be a sort of moral lesson that was involved. So often this is where you get, you know, the lesbian character uh, goes back to her husband or she kills herself. She goes insane. You know, there's all these terrible things that happen in the last chapter of the book, typically. Um, and Valerie Taylor, uh, who I'll be talking about quite a bit later, she she mentioned, you know, apparently anything goes just so everyone's miserable in the last chapter. So you could kind of ignore the last chapter and everything else would be very titillating. Um, and surprisingly to me, when I started doing this research, uh, most lesbian pulp was written by men for other straight men. Um, so it's very voyeuristic, um, often extremely unrealistic and, and problematic. And this kind of brings us to, I know that Meb is going to talk about this in more detail, um, but the editors of the latter created a guide called The Lesbian in Literature. And it's not just for pulp, it's for any, any mentions of lesbians in literature. And they created a ranking system. So it's an A, B, C, or T. Um, a is, you know, for you know good lesbian content. T is a T for trash. Um, and almost all pulp falls into the trash category. And so in the second edition, they actually removed most of the lesbian pulp. Um, so you see here, and often what's interesting is, you know, these covers don't tell you anything. Valerie Taylor, excellent author. This cover looks just as trashy as this one up here. So you have no idea if you're going to be reading a, a pulp that has 
excellent representation or this kind of trashy problematic representation. So shadowy sex, for example, this was rated a T for trash. Um, this is some more trash. So these were all, you know, considered trash novels. Um, the covers are very, um, they really pull you in. There's an art style that I think is very unique to this time period. Um, and then when we're talking about pulp, so even though these are, you know, considered trash or problematic representation, something that we we can forget when we're thinking about this time period is this was often the only place that people saw themselves represented. So it becomes the idea of survival literature is what Joan Nessel of the Lesbian Her Story Archives has described it as. And it's when you're not seeing yourself represented anywhere, even having this, this negative representation can be very meaningful. Um, and a lot of women would talk about reading a lesbian pulp novel as the first time they realized they weren't the only one, um, you know, that other people shared these feelings, um, you know, so even it was, even if the representation was problematic, this could be a, a way that people discovered something really important about themselves and also a way that they connected to community. And so that brings us to some of these really excellent examples of lesbian pulp. So lesbian authors of lesbian pulp. Um, I think the, the the first author a lot of people think about is is Anne Bannon, who wrote Odd Girl Out and the Bebo Brinker, Bebo Brinker Chronicles. Um, we also have authors like Patricia Highsmith. So if you've seen Carol, uh, that's based on The Price of Salt. Um, so that's a, that's a pulp novel. Um, Spring Fire uh, by you know Mar Marianne Meeker, Vin Packer, Valerie Taylor. Valerie Taylor is who I'm going to focus on. Um, I love Valerie. Uh, so she was born in Aurora, just outside of Chicago. Um, her first pulp was not a lesbian pulp. I remember when I read it, I was thinking, when is this when is this going to happen? When 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 are we going to get to the lesbian content? No, it, it's not. It's a straight it's a straight pulp. Um, it is still fairly subversive. She has a lot of interesting themes in there, but she used the proceeds from publishing this novel to pay for a divorce from an abusive husband. And she moved to Chicago with her kids. Um, and so she published nine lesbian novels uh, between 1957 and 1977. A lot of these are, you know, absolute, you know, legends of lesbian pulp. You can see some reprints below that I know Mev's going to talk about Nyad. So that's, you know, the top three are the original covers. The bottom three are from Nyad. Um, but Whisper Their Love sold two million copies. Um, so it was a really historic milestone for lesbian pulp, and it was a very realistic portrayal of lesbian life. The Girls in 3B is probably her most well-known um, book. Um, and she was not just a pulp author. Um, she was an activist. I think that she, what she became most well-known for were her pulp novels, but she was also a poet. She co-founded the Lesbian Writers Conference in Chicago, and she was an activist. Uh, she was involved in Mattachine Midwest, which was a very long-running activist group in Chicago. And this really shows up in her pulp novels. So she's very explicit. There's this um, interview she gives in Mattachine, uh, the Mattachine Review in 1961, where she talks about specifically wanting to write lesbian fiction to give examples, both to other les to reach other lesbians, but also to educate straight people and to have these characters that, you know, about lesbians that acted like human beings. Um, she also had a relationship with Pearl Hart, who's one of our namesakes, a very prominent lesbian attorney in Chicago. And she really is explicit about wanting to use pulp to educate. And this shows up a lot. So just to kind of give you some legal context at the time that Valerie Taylor is publishing her pulp novels in Chicago, we have the very first known uh, U.S. gay rights organization that was founded by Henry Gerber 100 years ago, so 1924 in Chicago. And then in the 50s and 60s, we have what we, we will call home file activism. And so it's things like Madashi Midwest or the Daughters of Belitis, who are the people that are publishing the latter uh, that made that rating system that we talk about. Um, so it's a lot of activist work going on at the time. And this is the law. So this is a law that was often used to punish um, queer people in Chicago, specifically in Illinois. It's often referred to as the cross-dressing law. So it was this idea that you had to be wearing a certain number of articles of clothing belonging to, quote unquote, your sex. And if you were not doing that, then you could be arrested. Um, so this was on the books until 1978 um, in, in Illinois, in Chicago. Um, so what we what we see at this time period, and this shows up in Valerie Taylor's books, um, is bar raids. Um, so often, specifically, I would say that people that were 
um, I guess we would say like non-gender conforming. So we think about, you know, drag performers, um, trans individuals, uh, butch lesbians. These were the people that would often get arrested and charged under this cross-dressing law. Um, and we have these raids of various bars that are going on into the 70s, even into the early 80s. Uh, and the very first Pride March in the U.S., actually, because we did it on a Saturday, not a Sunday, happened in Chicago in 1970. Um, and these bars, you know, we we start kind of with mafia run bars and then we go into a lot of like police payoffs. Often you had to pay off both the mafia and the police. Um, and so we have these big raids. And what would happen when they raided bars is they would arrest people, but then they would print names in the newspaper um, with lesbians. Often it's calling their husbands. Um, you know, there were very severe consequences that would happen when you were arrested in a bar raid. Um, people would lose their children. Um, there were people that committed suicide. Um, even if the charges were dropped, as they often were, having the names published in the newsletter or in the newspaper would have really dire consequences. Um, so there's a lot of risk when we're thinking about these lesbian folks, when we're thinking about, you know, how do you find each other? How do you know your own? And this is a theme that comes up in a lot of Valerie Taylor's novels is how do you let someone know who you are when there is this risk of being found out? So Pulps is one way of finding community. And I think that Taylor's early novels, she does adhere to this idea of there has to be a bad ending. Um, so it's always, you know, in the very last chapter, something bad happens. Um, but her later novels, you know, it definitely moves away from that standard. And even in those early novels, so for example, Stranger on Lesbos, spoiler alert, she does go back to her husband at the end of Stranger on Lesbos, but he's terrible. So as you're reading it, it's just this withering critique of heterosexuality. And then luckily in Return to Lesbos, she gets a happy ending. Um, but what Taylor does as well is she inserts all of this knowledge into her books. One of my favorite things she does is she has reading lists. Almost every book, there's a conversation with someone where like Whisper Their Love, for example, the character's uh, boss gives her a book. And, you know, it's a book that's a lesbian book. And that's how she kind of lets her know that that's who she is. That's who she thinks she is. Um, or characters will look at each other's bookshelves and point out certain books. And they're real books. So Taylor sometimes even references her own books within the books, which is interesting. But she gives, you know, a list. So this is all those books in the field, Bannon, Corey, Aldrich, Hall, Taylor, Wilhelm. So she gives examples of other books that people could find. So she's giving people a reading list to find positive representation. Um, she also, shockingly, I thought when I read them, she gives locations of real bars in Chicago. She doesn't name the real names, um, but I've checked the travel guides that we have at Gerber Hart, and these were real locations of, you know, gay neighborhoods at the time. So she gives driving directions um, in, in one of the pulp novels. Um, and then, you know, so there's names. They're not the real names, but again, they're similar to the names that show up in the pulps. Um, and the, something I find really interesting is she also mentions activist groups in her books. So she has an activist meeting in one of her books that's clearly modeled on Mattachine. And it frames it in a way where it's not scary. You know, it says like, oh, it has nothing to do with communists. You know, don't worry. Um, and then also it's, you know, it's nice to sit and drink coffee with people who know what you are. That's all. So it's letting people know that there are these activist groups um, where they could learn more and connect with a larger community. Um, so in Return to Lesbos, there's a homophile meeting. They talk about national newsletters that exist. Um, so this was something that I think would have been really valuable to people. Uh, I also appreciate that Taylor puts in statistics in a lot of her books. Uh, the Kinsey Report would have been recently released that talked about how many people were homosexual or had homosexual feelings. Um, and so she always references, you know, one tenth, you know, one in ten, you know, people are are gay. And I think that this is something that would have been very comforting to people. Um, and she says it in the interview, you know, some readers feel reassured and comforted when they discover that their own hidden feelings and secret experiences are actually quite common and not universally condemned. Um, and also, again, she's very explicit about wanting the truth about this activist movement to filter down to the general reading public. And a way to do that is through popular novels. So it's through things like pulp novels rather than lectures or academic sermons. You know, this is something that you can use pulp novels to reach people. Um, so kind of going back to the thesis, if they're trash, subversive, both, you know, I think they were very, they were, they, they were both. But I think when we look at people like Taylor, 
Um, this idea of knowing that you're not alone, giving you examples of how to find community, how to find each other, having these examples of positive lesbian relationships, sometimes negative as well, but just having an example. Um, it's balanced with a lot of bad rep bad representation, but I think it was extremely valuable. Um, so if you want to learn more, um, this is me uh, talking about the girls in 3B again, as I as I like to do. Um, but this is, you know, some information about how to learn more about Gerber Hart. I have a whole reading list of pulp. If you would like that, please send me an email. I would be happy to share the reading list with you. Um, and then again, if you're in Chicago, Queer Kindle Marked is on December 7th uh, from 10 to 4. And that will be a book sale and a queer artist market. And the last thing, because I always love reading this quote, is in the same interview with Valerie Taylor, she says, we do have a right to hope for books based on two civilized principles, that any relationship between two adults entered into by mutual consent is legitimate, and that any relationship that makes both persons happy is good. Perhaps if we believe that strongly enough and say so often enough, not in lectures and sermons, but through the medium of interesting and readable stories, other people will come to believe it too. Um, so I think this is uh, just an example of why books like these are so important. Um, really excited to hear from Mev, um, but I'm going to pass it back to Matisse right now. Um, thank you so much for having me, and I'm excited to do the Q&A and talk about pulp more. Thanks so much, Jen. That was great. Everyone, can we get like some like rounds of applause in the chat or in the uh, in the reactions? That was so wonderful, so insightful and informative. Thanks so much again, Jen. Um, uh, I'm really just as excited, though, for our second speaker, Mev, from the Wanderground. Um, Mev Miller is the instigator and lesbrarian for Wanderground. Uh, the starter collection for Wanderground originates from Mev's 40-plus years of personal gathering and preserving lesbian cultural artifacts and materials, especially publications and music. She was involved in the women in print movement for more than 25 years. Mev was also a DJ for a lesbian community radio show for 10 years. So, uh, Mev, I'm going to bring you on up and everyone give another round of applause for, for Mev at, from Wanderground. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to take a little bit of a different swerve from what Jen did, which was really wonderful. I learned a lot, a lot more because I don't know so much about pulps, but I have I'm going to talk a little bit about the transitions from pulp to literature. Uh, and I'm going to first talk a little bit about Wanderground people often. What is Wanderground? Well, we've we're new. We are located in Rhode Island. Uh, we incorporated in 2022, and we just recently this year leased a space and had an open house in October. Uh, so people are like, are you an archive, you're a museum, a library, what are you? So basically, yes, um, we are really focusing on New England primarily, but not totally, between 1950 and 2000. But because of my own personal collection, we do have a lot of national and international items. And because of my own background, um, we are, we have what in, in, internal to Wanderground and all the stuff we have, we have what I'm calling a special collection of women in print. So uh, we have our books listed by publishers. So a whole shelf of Aunt Lute, a whole shelf of Nyad, a whole shelf of New Victoria, all the different lesbian feminist presses, in addition to all the music and artifacts and everything else that we have. So that's a little bit about who we are. We're ever growing and we're really interested in gathering photos and personal papers and letters and so on and so forth from lesbians in the New England region. Even if you don't live here now and you lived here once upon a time, we'd be interested in having that as well. So back to transitions um, from pulp to literature. And one of the people I'm going to talk about, um, I think it was very pivotal in helping us to bring uh, that literature, the, the pulp into the literature, and that is Barbara Greer, um, who will also use the pen name of Jean Damon. Uh, she lived from 1933 to 2011. Uh, she was an American writer and publisher. She is credited with having built uh, the lesbian book industry in many ways. She was one of the primary, one of the early movers and shakers in a major way, I would say, although there were lots of other lesbian, lesbians and lesbian presses existing, she um, was, I guess, a lightning rod on some level, you might say. Um, she was a controversial figure. 
um, both well liked, but also um, kind of scary in some ways. Um, people would describe her as difficult, but I think she held true to her love and her mission for promoting lesbian fiction and supporting lesbian lives. That's really what she was interested in doing. And if you are really interested more in her life, there's this really nice biography written by um, Joanne Passett that's called Indomitable. And I um, highly recommend it to those who are interested in not only Barbara Greer's life, but also what was going on in feminist and lesbian publishing and some of the information around some of the pulp novelists that um, Jen was just speaking about. But one of the things that um, Barbara did was that she uh, was a writer for the latter. And primarily what she was doing with, with the latter was writing book reviews. She did other things as well um, con connected to the latter, uh, which was published between 1956 to 1972. Uh, started with the dollars of Belitis, but but that also was um, on the West Coast and became a national publication over time. But one of the things that she did do was gather her book reviews into one of the early books published by Nyad Press that she founded, and it was called Lesbiana. Um, and she did never, in her book, she never really referred to them as pulp. I think pulp is something that we call them now, but then she called them original paperback novels. And in the book about her, that's the reference is not to pulp, but rather to original lesbian, uh, original, I'm sorry, original paperback novels. Uh, but one of the things that because she was so into this literature, her thing was she believed that the power of literature to transform individual lives Literature not only proved lesbians had already has always existed, but they had rich and valuable history. And so she would obsessively go to newsstands and bookshops and just build her own private library of all of the um, paperbacks that Jen was referring to, um, and mostly really trying to seek out the lesbian books in that effort. Um, and she... She took some pushback from Barbara Giddings, who was one of the editors of The Ladder, and also even from Jane Rule, about why she was spending so much time on this. They thought it was, you know, like Barbara was more into politics and was more into like nonfiction and political stuff and, and couldn't understand why Barbara was so into it sort of implying that she was kind of wasting her time on doing this trashy stuff. But what she did first under the name of Jean Damon and out of the Daughters of Belitis in San Francisco, she compiled this uh, book that was about 28 pages long, The Lesbian in Literature. And then a second, as she it expanded in 1975, published by the latter in Reno, um, a second edition. And then by the time it gets to 1981, it's an actual book that's... Um, however many pages is in the book, it's actually got a spine and everything. Um, and it's 160 pages, 67 pages by the time she gets to this third edition. But one of the things that she did was what was has been called the Greer ratings. And Jen alluded to this a little bit, but anything, so she rated every single book. She didn't offer any details about the book. I mean, there wasn't any synopsis or anything like that, but but she rated them according to her understanding of lesbian material. So an A was a major lesbian characters and or action. B was minor lesbian or action. C was repressed lesbianism or characters. And then T was basically what she considered trash, which was most of the stuff that was written by men for men. Um, but then she also added, uh, so you could get an A, and an asterisk or an A and a double asterisk or an A and a triple asterisk, which meant that it was really above and beyond the best of what you could find in terms of being lesbian centered. Um, so that was her rating system that she used. And as Jen mentioned, um, because she got this pushback from Barbara and some other people, she let go of the trash in the second, um, in the second edition uh, there is no mention of trash. All Most of the markings for trash are in the first edition. Then after that, she does refer to trash only if an author has written several other novels 
but one or two of them might be what she considered trash. And that's, um, I actually have an example of that later on. I just want to do a really quick brief personal interlude because I was looking at the trash book recently and noticed that there's a book in there that's called Sappho of Lesbos by Arthur Weigel um, that gets a, a double star. And the reason I'm excited about that is because my grandfather had a huge library of books and there was one single book in his whole library that had my grandmother's handwritten name as the owner of that book. And it's this book. So you could just imagine how thrilled I am that I have this book about Sappho that has my grandmother's signature in the front of it. It's just hysterical to me. But when I found out it was a double star, I got really excited. So back back to the topic here. So Nyad Press was from 1973 to 2003. And part of what I think Barbara Greer is, in terms of the transformation is that she brings the double A and the triple A books back into print. Um, and she writes, she wrote this to Ann Bannon, actually, about even about Ann's books. These books are not great literature, but they are emotionally, socially, and historically a part of lesbian development in this country and in this century. And so after the 50s and 60s, after the books had been read on the bus and thrown away, um, she really, because she was finding them, she really wanted to bring them back to life. And so she started NIAD. Um, in 1973 with Donna McBride and uh, Anita Marshawn and Muriel Crawford with $2,000. Um, their first book was The Late Cumber by Sarah Aldridge, not a pulp novel, but she was the one who invested some money into it. Um, the press closed in 2003, but they sold all the stock to Bella Books. And so some of those titles continue on today. But one of the first group that they did was Valerie Taylor. Um, which was a pseudonym for Velma Young. And as Jen mentioned, these are the books that were reprinted by um, Nyad Press. And these are the Nyad Press covers. Clearly not as um, titillating as the pulp novels were. I think part of this is because, uh, and the, she did introduce these as, a mar mass, as the smaller mass market size Um but I think part of it was because of money. You know, it was cheap to do a two-color cover than it was to do a whole big art thing going on. Plus, she that wasn't the point of her doing the books anyway. Uh, so she was just really committed to getting these things back into print. Um, and just as a side note, uh, Whisper Their Love, um, Nyad never reprinted that, but it was reprinted in 2006 by Little Sisters Classics from Arsenal Pulp. And Barbara Greer actually wrote the introduction um, to that reprint of Whisper Their Love. Um, and then new fiction from, from Valerie in 1981 called Prism. Um, and then there's the Ann Bannon series, also reprinted in a smaller um, size, like a mass market size. Um, the Odd Girl Out cover is the original one from the pulp there on the left. And then these were the covers. It was a series of five books um, Odd Girl was the first one, I Am Woman, Woman in the Shadows, Journey to a Woman, and Bebo Brinker. These were all published between 1957 and 1962. Arguably, the most popular of Bannon's characters throughout the series is Bebo Brinker. Um, uh, she refuses to dress femininely, and readers only once read about her wearing a skirt. In fact, she takes jobs that are clearly below her abilities and declines a higher education because she knows that these vocations would limit her to wearing feminine clothing. She's a brave person who tried to pass as a guy at a time when most lesbians were totally undercover. Those women of that area who lived openly like that were heroic. They didn't live a regular society. They really lived on the edge and they lived on some fringe. And so Bebo is um, a character that is throughout um, this series of books. Then Nyad again reprints it again in a in a larger size trade size in 1986, um, so that it has a little bit more life to it. Because the smaller books, she they they were kind of pulpish in a way too. The books are all yellowed, the pages are not great. These have, are a little bit more um, resilient to wear and tear. Um, another important author during those times was Jane Rule. Um, She's actually kind of newer to the scene, but Desert of the Heart came out in 1980. 
1964. And Barbara gave that an A triple asterisk rating. And this is sort of the, so she first published it as a smaller mass marketing kind of size, and then uh, a, a regular trade size in 84. By 85, it's being picked up as a film, Desert Hearts. Maybe some of you have seen it. So they republished it again with a different color cover. And so over time, um, this particular item had um, different covers over the years and different sizes. Um, but basically it's regarded as one of the, uh, the film actually desens desensitizes lesbianism and presents a positive portrayal of a romance. Um, so again, not really hope at this point, but actually coming into some recognizable form of literature. Other titles by Jane Rule, um, these are a little bit past the pulp era because they she publishes these in 74 and 75 against the season and young in one, young in one another's arms. Um, and they're um, by Fawcett, I think. So they're, they're kind of into the more major houses. Um, but again, um, Nyad reprints them in trade size with rather plain covers. Um, but, and then this last one by Jane Rule, I just wanted to bring up because Barbara wasn't a big fan of nonfiction stuff. She was okay with biographies and memoirs and things like that, but she really was into the fiction. Um, but Nyad didn't publish these two books, but I think they're worth mentioning because <laughs> she did rate them in the second edition of Lesbian and Literature, an overview of major contributors to lesbian literature. And this is where you can get a list of various different authors that um, Jane Rule thought were really important for understanding lesbian lives and lesbian literature. Then we have Claire Morgan, um, who wrote Price of Salt um, in 1952, another romance novel uh, picked up by Nyad in 1984 with the plain cover with salt on it. Um, by the pen name, Claire Morgan, and then as her real name when it comes out in 1991, and then the movie, Carol, in 2016. Um, and Highsmith, maybe people may not be aware of this, but Patricia Highsmith was a suspense writer, and she was the one who wrote Strangers on a Train, which many of you might have heard of. Um, so she didn't want to be tagged as a lesbian writer, and that's why she chose the name Claire Morgan to sort of separate herself from, I guess, from her more legitimate type of writing that she had been doing. Um, but The Price of Salt is her only novel um, that really has a strong lesbian relationship in it, um, and it does have a happy ending, which was pretty much unprecedented, unprecedented at the time. And then Gail Wilhelm, um, who had uh, these two books, We Are Me Too Are Drifting and Torchlight to Valhalla. Uh, we Too Are Drifting came out in 1935 and Torchlight came out in 1938. And so these were re resurrected again by Nyad. And it's interesting because Nyad took a lot of flack sometimes about, you know, you know, anybody, you know, Nyad sometimes gets dismissed because it wasn't really serious literature. It was just romance and it was just fluff. And it was just like, and and that may be true. But, uh, you know, for those of us who are coming out in the 70s and 80s, Nyad books were really important to us because they, they like the pulp of the 50s, gave us uh, a vision of ourselves that we might not have had in other places. Um, and then uh, Marge Hastings. March Hastings. Um, this uh, three woman was published in 1958 originally as a pulp, um, but she also did another book that was called Obsessed, which Barbara marked as trash. And so that one never got picked up by Nyad, but Nyad did publish Three Women, which has then been re-released again in 2006 by Cleus Press. Um, she was, sing uh, her um, Sally Singer, who is her pseudonym, it's her real name is Sally Singer. And she um, was one of the few lesbian pulp authors who actually lived openly as a lesbian for nearly her whole life. And she supposedly had, was romantically involved with another author of lesbian pulp books, Pat Perdue, who was writing under the name Randy Salem. Um, 
So Randy Salem, this was also a book that was rated a triple asterisk by Barbara um, and the editors of the Lesbian and Literature books. Um, and Nyad republished this one in 1989. And then other books that were not published by um, Nyad, but did get high ratings. Although it's interesting, I think Sex in the Shadows is kind of curious because it's an A, but a T at the same time. So not really quite sure what that was about. There's no explanation, except that there it is. So other bibliographies that came along, um, the uh, Women Loving Women, which came out of Woman Press, which was located in Chicago. Um, this came out in uh, 1974, and it was developed by the Lesbian Writers Conference, which Jen alluded to with Valerie Taylor. So I don't know how much connection there is with that, but there it is. And then this other book. So as you can see, as more and more lesbian literature comes out, it's evolving from the pulps and into a more robust uh, writing literature that's expanding. And so the, the books, uh, the, the directories of the different books comes out more and more. So that's my final remark. I just wanna let you know about a couple of events coming up with Wanderground. Um, we are doing an on-site event called using it called Artifacts using Wonderground Artifacts for Insp Inspiration and Art Play. Uh, we have a, a local artist who's lesbian artist who's going to be working. We're going to have all kinds of art materials and stuff. That's a required registration. So get on our mailing list and you can find out information about that. And then we'll be doing a Zoom uh, in December called Dyke the Halls. Winter Greetings from Wanderground Archives, in which we will be showing um, a lot of the things in our archive that have wintry theme type things. So Solstice and Hanukkah and Christmas and Kwanzaa and so on and so forth. And both of those events are for lesbians. And if you want to see more about our books, go to our website and collections and explore and have fun. And thank you all very, very much for your attention. And that's it for me. Yay. Thank you so much, Mev. Everyone, let's give uh, Mev a huge round of applause in the Yay. chat. Um, that was great. <clears throat> I'm just going to bring Jen um, and Mev and make sure we're all up here. And we're going to move into the Q&A portion of our... Um, well, sorry, I'm just, I'm trying, I'm talking and uh, and pressing buttons at the same time. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to move into our Q&A portion. I just want to say, Jen, Mev, those were really insightful mm -hmm. and wonderful talks. Thank you both so much for, for sharing everything that you know. Um, I have one question to start us off. And then I've seen we've got a hand raised already. Um, so I, my first question, just to kind of get us going, and everyone... You start thinking about your questions. You know what I mean? You can raise your hand or you can to come on up if you want to ask in person. You can ask in the chat. But my first question to get us going is, can you talk a bit more about this rating system and like what would have garnered a T rating, right? Was it because it was poorly written? Was it about the representation? Um, I'm just so, what would, I'm like, as someone who loves the finer things and the trash both, right? What what were they, do you, what, do you have any insights there? Um, my understanding of it was, uh, I'm actually looking it up here, so I can, maybe I can read it to you right out of the book and see what sure. she is. Uh, hold on. Basically, the T was, um, regardless of the quantity of lesbian action or characters involved in the book, the quality was essentially poor. So there's not much more to go on other than that. I think it was maybe offensive or maybe titillating but not purposeful or I don't necessarily know that it has so much to do with the writing itself um because when you read some of the other ones I don't know if they're you know as literature or as writing maybe not so great but I don't know what is your sense of it Jen it, yeah I, I would agree and I think it's also um seems to be ones that are more you know about the male gaze uh more or, G-A-Z-E, uh, you know, that sort of um, voyeuristic and like they're, they're not, the lesbians aren't acting like human beings. They're more like props. Um, it's more pornographic, I would say. Um, it's interesting because she so rarely adds commentary in there, but there's one I was working with um, 
Victor Banis was a gay man who wrote, um, primarily wrote gay, gay men's pulp, um, but he also wrote some lesbian pulp. And I was working with his, his niece who has just started a, you know, a whole foundation for him, but she has a little comment about him and it's a mix of A and T's and it's, you know, it's a shame that he incorporates so many trash elements because he's otherwise a good author. <laughs> he's like a good writer. It's like, this is good <laughs> writing, but there's trash content in it. So yeah, I think it's the the themes and the way they're writing about um, the sexual content. Yeah. And as I'm looking through this initial one where all the T's are, many of them are men. Some are women, but, and, and there are some men who do have, A's and whatever, but the far, most of the T's <laughs> have noticeably male names. <laughs> Got it. The authors. Um, okay, we have a question from Maida. Maida, I'm just going to add you uh, to the spotlight and please come up and ask your question. <laughs> uh, I really wanted to make a statement and thanks. This was just great. I just want to add, to clarify a few things that were said about Barbara Greer, who I, I was a friend of and... Uh, um, a little bit of a protege of because of my own pulp collecting from the early 70s. And one thing is the issue of dropping the trash for the third, second and third editions of the bibliography. Uh, I wrote the forward to the third edition, by the way. Um, she did. She dropped that because she couldn't afford the length of the book that would have, have to be published. She told me that explicitly to keep mm. all the trash in that would have added hundreds more pages. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was a, some, basically, a, a, you know, especially in the early 80s, uh, you know, money problems at all time with publishers. The other thing was about, um, uh, you know, why did I had only published all this kind of romancy stuff? She, I remember she was so upset one day because she had published, she had republished a book from the 1920s or about some Paris lesbians, I forget who it was. She was so excited about publishing that. It was selling so badly and it, it was just, I mean, she was hurt that people would rather read the romancy stuff instead of learn about real lesbians and the history that she was trying to put out there in her publishing efforts. So I just wanted to say that in defense of Barbara Greer, who was a very difficult person, I agree, but boy, did she do stuff for all of us that without her, we wouldn't know any of this stuff. So thank you. Yeah, I, I want, thanks, Matt, Matt. I wanted to also say that um, the fact that she collected all that and kind of rated it, I think is really, you know, even though, Barbara Giddings and, and Jane Rowe were sort of like, why are you wasting your time on that? You know, now it's like, I could see then their point of view because because it was pulp, if you will. But I think now it's just like a, a great amount of respect that she took the enormous amount of time it must have taken her. I mean, I she probably read one of those things in 10 minutes, you know, because that's how fast you can read them sometimes. But but I also know that the NIAD itself didn't really do that much nonfiction. And I'm glad to hear that perspective on it. Um, I mean, yeah, so thank you. There was a class issue involved. She was, she was a very working class person and had only gone to high school. These other people had advanced degrees. I think that was part of the difference between them. And, and also she really felt that the, the paperback originals, pulps, they got to all sorts of women who didn't usually buy books because they mm -hmm. found them in the drugstore. She always made that point. They were available and they were about other working class women for the most part. Right. And, and the biography does make the point that she was like saving her pennies so that she could go and, and buy, buy these books. She was, she was that committed to it. Um, yeah, I have enormous amount of respect for her. She was difficult, but she was, she was, I mean, she was a mover and shaker. She got done what she needed to get done. Um, and and mm -hmm. in, in many ways, we 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 owe her a debt of gratitude. Thank you so much for your for your insights. That's really, I really appreciate that. Um, I have one question from the chat, and then I have another person who's been raising their hand, and then a second person too. So um let's see. The question from the chat was, I'm just scrolling back up, but can either of you speak on the differences in plot, tone, and style between male authors and the female authors? This is from Carissa Cunningham. Well, I, I would say that I, I collect a lot of pulps um, and I don't read a lot of them because often they are terrible. Um, but I think that it's there's something about... Um, I mean, I think it's similar when you think about, you know, often male directors 
versus female directors and, you know, how, what they're choosing to focus on in, in a relationship or the sexual content, like how they're, how they're focusing on it. I know Valerie Taylor, I think she has a, a quote where she's like, I wanted to have real women that, you know, had jobs and allergies and lives, you know, like to have this kind of full character um, as opposed to, you know, almost a doll that you're projecting your own feelings onto. Um, and that's not to say that that's, you know, all male authors and all, all, all female authors, but that's, I think, just a generalization that is, is often apparent. Thank you for I your answer. Any, I don't have any answer to it. So. <laughs> That's great. Um, we had someone asking to raise, uh, asking a question in the chat. Um, Brianna, um, I'm just going to spotlight you, and then Catherine, you're after that. Thanks, Matisse. It's Brina. So Brina. my question, my question is, in the 50s and 60s, what what did I'm going to say lesbians, but what did they what call did they themselves? And would they have been queer? Would they have been homosexual? Yeah, I, I saw in the chat, I would say queer, definitely not that this is too early for, for queer. Um, but I, I feel like lesbian was something used. I know that Taylor talks about not, you know, some characters not enjoying how that word sounds. I think that gay would sometimes come up. Invert was something that would be a little bit more clinical. Um, I like the, you know, a lot of pulps will say like the twilight sex or the shadowy sex. There's, you know, things like that. I, it's a little bit later than this, but as a, as a bisexual, I enjoy some of the pulps called bisexuals, uh, ACDC lovers. Uh, so the like both currents. So it's just different slang that was used, but no queer would definitely be later. Um, I think that there are definitely themes in a lot of these books. So a lot of Taylor's books, they don't just have lesbians in it. They are primarily about a lesbian relationship, but she has gay male friends. And there's a lot of different types of, you know, LGBTQ life that are explored in her books. Um, but yeah, they wouldn't have used queer. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're muted, Matisse. Kathy, thank you. Uh, thanks, Brenna, for that question. And Kathy, your turn. Thank you. Thank you. I love this. I uh, was a Bebo Brinker fan forever. Mm -hmm. um, but two of the things I wanted to raise, maybe it's too later or whatever, is June Arnold, The Cook and the Carpenter. Um, you know about that book. And the other is, for me, The Memory Board by Jane Rule is one of the most wonderful books I've ever read. And in a sense, I mean, it centers a lesbian couple, but it's really about memory loss and kind of an extraordinary book. And so I'm just kind of curious about, you know, is that an evolution where we have other themes? Um, and also whether any of these women, I know Barbara Greer certainly did, but did these other women, were they activists in a broader sense? I mean, in addition to sort of being kind of promoting a gay identity for which it would be enough because we need that. But I'm just wondering whether there were other folks with a sort of intersectional politics or whatever. Do you mean of the authors that we mentioned or are you yeah. talk about the publishers? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know how activists they were. And maybe Jen knows more than I do about this, but um in terms of like the cook and the carpenter, I mean, that's definitely later. That's that's not initially what one would consider a pulp. That was an original novel that came out later, later as, I think, in my understanding of it, and I see Carol's here, Carol CJ is here. She could probably correct me on this. <laughs> my, my history is a little bit off sometimes because I'm a little later to it, but that a lot of what was happening then because... It, NIAD came out about the same time as some of the other publishers, Diana and Daughters, and some of the others were coming out. Persephone um, were coming out with more lesbian books that had had more of a feminist perspective to them, if you will, a more of an activist perspective to them. So they were looking at lesbianism in a in a, in a during the civil rights period, basically. You know, I mean, into the sixties and seventies, and so they're 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 not in in survival mode in the same way as the 
pulps were in the 50s and 60s. So, um, and then Memory Board is also a later one of Jane Rule's Jane. And I would say Jane Rule was, you know, she wrote a lot of different kinds of things. So I don't know that I would call her necessarily an activist per se, but I think she definitely had, you know, some perspectives that, you know, were um, more towards the rights of lesbians to some extent, but I don't know how much in their personal lives they were taking those on as issues. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, if that's what you're asking. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know the most about Taylor and I, I do feel like a lot of the other lesbian authors, not all of them, but a lot of them were uh, quite, quite closeted or not, not open. Um, Taylor was, you know, identified both very openly as a lesbian, but also as a bisexual. Um, I was talking to her daughter-in-law who said she, you know, she believed that all people were inherently bisexual. And I was like, okay, all right. Um, but she, um, no, she, she also, yeah, I know that she was involved in elder rights. She was, you know, very active in the homophile movement with Mattachine. Um, so she did, she did a lot of different activist work. And I think that was a big part of her life. Um, but yeah, it's interesting what you said about the, the, the memory board, which I've not read, but it reminds me of, you know, a lot of YA, a lot of LGBTQ YA, it was almost entirely like the coming out story or like something traumatic has happened. And now we have so many books that are just, they happen to be gay and there are other things going on in their life. There are other issues. And like, that's not the center part of the plot, um, which I think is really beautiful that we have so much, you know, queer romance and we have sci-fi fantasy and we have all of these other ways that people are exploring their lives. Um, because I think that that's not the only issue that's being addressed. Um, so I think that that's a really great yeah. progression. Yeah, and I, to add to that, I think that a lot of the early, especially the Naya novels, but also a lot of the early lesbian literature that was coming out was really coming out literature. You know, women finding out about themselves later in life. You think of authors like C Catherine Forrest or, um, you know, Curious Wine, you know, some of those those other ones like that that, that, you know, after a while, I was just like, God, another coming out novel? Can we, like, move along, you know? I mean, yeah. that's why somebody like um, Barbara Wilson's book, one of my favorite books uh, published by Seal Press, is called Murder in the Collective. It's like, okay, so now we're, like, you know, getting into other themes of, you know, murder and suspense and, you know, some things that still have, you know, lesbians involved and lesbian love involved and so on and so forth, but we're kind of moving along to other topics. And so... Um, but I think initially a lot of that literature, 60s, 70s, 80s, was a lot of coming out literature, not only of youth, but of midlife women who were coming out after marriages and so on and so forth. And, yeah. You know, so. That's wonderful. And in that way, and that one of the things that I remember reading in, in uh, Barbara Greer's biography was Anne Bannon, you know, wasn't particularly out, but... Um, Barbara had written to her and told her to come to this meeting. And so Anne came to the meeting and the meeting was like, what other authors do you want to read about? And somebody said, oh, Anne Bannon. And Barbara's like, oh, she's here. You know, and, and Anne was like completely <laughs> not expecting that, you know. So so it was like, if you got involved with Barbara Greer, you were going to be outed. And so you just had to kind of deal with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have one more question. Um, someone raised their hand. I think this is gonna be our final question of the night. I know we're at the sort of end of our time. So um, Eleanor, I'm gonna spotlight you now so you can come up and ask your question. Um, here we go. Um, it won't let me add a spotlight, but Eleanor, why don't you unmute yourself so you can ask your question. Um, all I was wondering was how do you actually find these books to read them? Like, I've tried to look into finding them online, and it's just, it's kind of hard to find them. Yeah, it, it can definitely, especially some of those older editions, and they're very fragile, so they fall apart. But um, I would say, so Gerber Hart, we have a circulating library. So if you're in Chicago, we have a lot of those books that you could check out and take home. Um, if they are, you know, fragile or rare, it might be in our special collections, but you could read it at Gerber Hart. Um, so there are libraries throughout the U.S. where you can go and read the books there. Um, sometimes you have good luck at vintage stores and thrift stores. That's where I pick up a lot of mine. Uh, but it can be hard. Um, I don't know what you think, Mev, about finding them now. Yeah, I think it's 
it it's it's getting scarcer and scarcer and even like i was trying to find i tried to find covers of some of the original ones that i don't have in our possession here but i was trying to find the original cover and you can't even find the covers online anymore because some of them have been reprinted and so you know but it's really i think it's harder and harder to find them now because so many people have been looking for them that you know unless somebody's got them squirreled away in their attic someplace you know that you're you're just they're just going to be hard to find but that said sometimes internet archive has some of the books um reprinted in there so you can find electronic versions of them sometimes which isn't quite as much fun as handling the musty book but <laughs> um yeah, yeah. It, it's just hard to come by Well, and some of those reprints, like you mentioned, you know, the girls in 3B, like you can find some of these reprints. Um, the one thing I would caution occasionally, like Valerie Taylor has a reprint of Unlike Others, and they actually changed her writing in it, and they made it very pornographic. So the publisher, just something to keep out for. Um, sometimes they change the content in it. Um, but yeah, it's hard. They can, they, they can get easily damaged. I have a whole box of pulps that I'm trying to treat that are smelly and bad and you know it's just hard to do that but they're they're worth it if you can find them um and sometimes they pop up Um, well, thanks so much, Jen and Mev, for this, your wonderful talks and contributions. Um, uh, everyone, uh, everyone, make sure you are following the History Project, uh, Wanderground, and Gerber Hart. Subscribe to all of our newsletters. Check out our, go to our events. We, we've got a holiday party coming up in a few weeks, and we're just, we want people to get together in person, you know, these times. It's really important that we're, it's great to be virtual, but it's also important we're, we're together. So go, go find your local community. If you're in Providence, Chicago, or Boston, come find us. We're so happy to be here with you all. Um, and I just want to echo, it was someone in the chat was saying how wonderful it was to see all these like older lesbians here. Um, all together and I am also so heartened from that I want to echo that I want to shout you all out for just being there and being getting through it and being here with us today we are so appreciative of you and we love you so um uh anyways uh thanks again uh Jen Mev do you quick, have more to say I, I just a quick thing we're actually in Cranston which is south of Providence Cranston. so just just um so if you want to get in touch with us and come visit us um we're happy to have you come that's all I wanted to say. Thank you all for coming. Could you, are you saving the chat, Matisse? Could you save the chat for us? I'm, having um, I'm not sure if, the, I, I hope so. Um, okay. uh, but I'm going to stop the video recording now. Thanks everyone for coming.